QuickBooks Online 2024 Month 1 Reports. Get ready and some coffee because the accounting team is on board with QuickBooks Online 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the Matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey's saying. So get one, because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our Get Great Guitars 2024 QuickBooks Online sample company file we set up in a prior presentation, opening the major financial statement reports like we do every time. The reports, they're on the left. We're in the favorites. We're right-clicking on the balance sheet to open a link in a new tab. Right-clicking the profit and loss, otherwise known as the income statement, to open a link in a new tab. And the same for the trial balance. If you don't have that trial balance in the favorites, you can search for it in the search field. Tapping to the right, closing up the hamburger. Changing the range, going from 010124 tab, 013124 tab. Let's run it so we can refresh it. Tabbing to the right, closing up the hamburger, repeating the process of the range change. 010124 tab, 013124 tab, refreshing it again. Tabbing to the right, closing up the hamburger, and those rangings, they are a changing another time. 010124 tab, 013124 tab, and we will run to refresh again. Let's go back to the balance sheet. This time we've entered basically one month of data input. We want to analyze the financial statements. Quick recap of what has been done thus far for the first month of operations. We set up our new company file with QuickBooks. We then took a look at those foundational items necessary to be able to start running our accounting process to do actual financial transactions with the forms. Those setup items found in the COG under say the your company area where we have the settings we have the managing of the users and we set up the payroll and then the lists including the chart of accounts products and services we also brought in our customers our vendors and our employees we then imagined that we did have a prior accounting system that we started working on that we pulled the beginning balances into our current system as of the end of the prior period so we put all of our beginning balances in place as of December 31st, 2023, so that we only had balance sheet accounts for the current period we're starting to work in, which will be starting January 1st, 2024. And then we entered one month of data input for the current month. The first few transactions being those that were similar to a new business that, that comes into play. So if I, if I collapse all these, We'll recall that we have the assets. First thing we typically need to do is gather some cash. So we need some cash so that we can have cash to then purchase the things that are going to help us generate revenue, which are the fixed assets and the inventory. The inventory is in here. Inventory. So that means how do we do that when we start? Well, we can't get the money from the customers because they would have to pre-order something that we don't have to sell them yet. So typically you take out a loan or 
you put it in yourself with equity. So we started off with those types of transactions, which are not those. Here's the loan and here's the owner investment. Those are not the transactions that we expect to happen on a monthly basis. Those are the startup transactions. And then we bought the inventory. We bought the, the furniture to have our nice, beautiful guitar shop that attracted customers in so that we can then sell them guitars. And then we started doing one month of data input, recording the sales of the guitars and the related costs to those sales, finally having some impact on the income statement where we had the, the income and the related expenses for it. So this time, let's go back through. Now that we have, have done a month worth of data input, we want to analyze the results on the financial statements. How, how have the financial statements been constructed? And let's deconstruct it a little bit now and, and go in the reversed order, right? So we've gone through, we've constructed the financial statements using basically the forms by cycle here. And now we have the end result after one month of data input. Let's do a little bit of deconstructing now, drilling down from the end result back to the source documents, remembering that the balance sheet and the income statement are our major financial statements. All other reports are basically sub ledgers for the most part for one or multiple line items, giving us more detail about one or multiple line items on the balance sheet or the income statement. To do this, let's go back to the first tab as well. And I'm going to open up my chart of accounts. So we're going to go into our sales tab and let's go, not the sales tab, transactions, chart of accounts on the right, close up the hamburger and there's our chart of accounts. You'll recall that the chart of accounts has been provided by QuickBooks. We basically used QuickBooks chart of accounts, which is way too large. And we tried to see if we can fit what we do within it. After two months of data input, we might then go into the chart of accounts and remove some of the excess accounts. So we don't have uh, too many accounts in there, which could make things a little bit slower. So let's go back to the balance sheet and analyze this uh, piece by piece. So I'm going to then say, let's close this whole thing up. We've got our assets, liabilities, and equities. That's the accounting equation. And that's a representation of our double entry accounting system. The other way we could represent the double entry accounting system being with debits, credits, debits equaling the credits. That's what the trial balance looks like, which we'll take a look at shortly. Now we can also think about this accounting equation, just using some algebra as assets minus liabilities equals equity. So 227695.77 minus the liabilities 77372.33 gives us the equity of the 150, 323, 44. That's the book value of the company. So looking at it from a finance standpoint or from the standpoint of the owner, equity, you might just look at it that way because equity is kind of like the book value of the company. Although you don't actually have $150,323, even though we measure it in dollars, because the assets are not going to be in cash. If we were just wanted to hold on to cash, we wouldn't have started our business. Why, why did we start the business to earn revenue? And cash doesn't help us to earn revenue sitting in the bank. It helps us earn revenue in an investment. So we invested the cash in the inventory and the fixed assets, property, plant, and equipment. So therefore, although the book value of the business is this 153.73 or 323, we would actually have to liquidate the business most times to actually access that cash, meaning we'd have to sell the assets, get the 227.695 in cash, although we wouldn't get exactly that amount because we don't know exactly how much we would get if we sold the business but that's what we currently have on the books, right? That's kind of an estimate. And then we'd have to pay off the bank and the loans, and then we can get the money. So that's in theory, what we would get if in essence, we liquidated the business is uh, the general idea. So if I start to open up the assets, what do we have under the assets? We've got the current assets, we've got the fixed assets, and we've got the other assets. Recall that the current assets is a financial accounting category that basically means they're more liquid assets, assets that we're going to use basically in the next year. For example, if I open it up, that means they're closer to basically the checking account, basically closer to cash. Then instead of having cash in cash equivalents, which would be a normal external reporting uh, uh, type, 
we have the checking accounts or the cash accounts. Why? Because from an internal bookkeeping perspective, the checking accounts are the ones that you can connect to the bank feeds. They have a different functionality. Therefore, we have this extra drop down not needed for normal external reporting purposes, but necessary because we have a different account type that we have set up that's more specific than, than a checking account, uh, than a current asset account. That also adds a longer statement because now we have these subtotals with the drop down. So then we've got the accounts receivable, similar type of, but by the way, if I go into the checking account, you'll see that we have more activity in the checking account than any other account. So oftentimes when people analyze the accounts, the first thing they drill down on is the checking account and they become intimidated because we have a lot of activity in there and we have a lot of transaction types. It doesn't look like from first glance, there's any rhyme or reason as to what's going on in here. Everything's running through it. That's because the checking account is the lifeblood of the organization and therefore it's involved in every cycle. No other account is that way. So analyzing any other account is a lot easier to see what's gonna happen in the account because it's not involved, it's not integrated in all of the cycles. Also remember that this is a transaction report, which is kind of like a general ledger report, meaning it's given us the activity by date. So transaction by date report, basically a GL general ledger report. So then you can also filter it up top and the most common filtering types are the transaction types. When you're in uh, these transaction reports, you can add a filter and the most common is transaction type generally equal to, and then you can pick the types of transactions that you want to be filtering by thusly. All right, let's close that back out. Let's go back on, exit this one. Then the accounts receivable is kind of the, uh, the accounts receivable is another current asset account, which also has its own dropdown, which seems somewhat tedious. Why does QuickBooks do that? We don't really need that if there's only one accounts receivable account, which there often is, because the accounts receivable has its own account again in the general ledger, because accounts receivable has its own specific needs, because it has a sub ledger, which tracks out the customer activity, backing up and supporting the accounts receivable account. Therefore, we have a whole nother series of accounts that support the accounts receivable. If I go to the tab to the right, right click on it, duplicate that tab, and let's take a look at some of those reports. We're going to go down to the reports on the left, close up the hand boogie. And if we go down to the who owes you, basically most of these reports are some type of sub ledger that are giving you more information on the accounts receivable. Just the most classic kind of report that's just a normal sub ledger is the customer balance summary, which gives you the information by customer. So these are the outstanding balances, the total then tying out to the 14,687, which is on the balance sheet 14,687. We also will manage that internally in the customer center. If you didn't have any invoices, because you're not making invoice sales, you're selling on a cash based system, you won't have accounts receivable. Accounts receivable is an accrual account. And I just want to point out that if you, if, if you thinking that you want to be on a cash or accrual based system, you, you usually can't have it. You don't have like a choice. You're basically going to say, what is the industry standard? If I have to invoice people then I'm going to be on an accrual system. If I don't have to invoice people, I'm basically using a cached system. Now you could still call it a cash system, even though you could still call it an accrual system, even if you didn't use accounts receivable technically. Why? Because if you just used a sales receipt and you just got paid at the same point in time, both the cash and accrual system would record the same transaction at the same point in time, but for different reasons. The accrual system would record it because that's when you earned the revenue and the cash system would record it because that's when you got the cash. It's only when you have an invoice where you earn the revenue and the cash is going to be coming at a different point in time that it's important to define which method that you're using because they're going to end up recording revenue at two different points. So in other words, if I switch this to a cash based system up here, which you don't typically want to do for normal reporting, we no longer see the accounts receivable. It's removed it 
because now it's it's not going to record anything until we actually received the money so i just want to point that out because people often get confused between that cash and accrual basis often thinking i want to be on the easier method if i can on a cash-based method but really it's driven by what industry you're in. <laughs> if you have to track accounts receivable, you're going to have to track accounts receivable if that's the industry you're in. Okay, so if I go into the accounts receivable, you can see the transaction detail report. Now, it's a lot easier to manage because it should simply be going up with invoices and then down with the payments that we have received on them. We invoice people for work done. They owe us money. They pay us for the work that has been done. The accounts receivable goes back down and we get money, which is a, the checking account. All right, next account. We've got the other current assets. Now, this whole group are the current assets that don't have a special need and therefore needed their own account category, like the checking account and the receivables. The first one being inventory, which you would think, why doesn't that have a special category if we're tracking inventory on a perpetual inventory method? Because it's going to need a subledger. However, QuickBooks is not forcing us as they are with the accounts receivable to tie out to the subledger. So it's not, it's not blocking us uh, in some way. So it doesn't have its own category, even though it basically has a subledger. But let's take a look at the subledger. If I tab over here and we go to the reports on the left, I'll just type in inventory valuation summary. And you'll recall that this is the inventory that we have and the quantity and this is the value so that 15678 should tie out to what's on the balance sheet of the inventory here it does not let's try it again i think i need a date change 01010123 okay i can't do it 01312224 i forgot what is happening i've been lost i okay so we got 9698 Let's go back on over here, 9698. So we will only have that subledger if we're tracking inventory on a perpetual inventory system uh, within QuickBooks. There are other inventory methods you can use. You can use a periodic inventory method, but we used a perpetual inventory method here. We have the stocks. Now you wouldn't expect, by the way, if I go into inventory, the inventory is gonna be going up uh, if you have a perpetual inventory system, when we purchase the inventory and we purchase inventory with money going out, which would be a check form or an expense form uh, or possibly a bill form, and then inventory is going to go down when we sell the inventory, either with an invoice or a sales receipt, the two sales receipt forms. So that's what we would expect to see in the inventory account. The investment account is just a short term investment that we wouldn't typically be dealing with all the time uh, in most businesses because we're not in the business of investing, but we might have a short-term holding account, in which case you wouldn't expect a whole lot of activity in this account, possibly having month-end adjustments to adjust for the increases and decreases in the fair market value of stocks and bonds if they're traded on a market. And then we've got the payments uh, to deposit. That account is zero. That is a clearing account. If we don't want that account to show up for external reporting, we could then select up top and say that we want uh, uh, non-zero accounts. Having it show up is great for internal reporting. If I go into it, you can see that this account should be going up when we make when we receive money from customers with the sales uh, receipt and. Uh, basically with the with, and with the payment form. So a sales receipt and payment form. Uh, the payment form is the payment form after we have an invoice, we get paid, and then we put it into this clearing account possibly. Same with the sales receipt, sales at a cash register, so that we can then group them together to put them into the bank account in the same format as will be shown on the bank side, reflected with the bank transactions, so we can do our bank reconciliations. So that should be zero. Oftentimes, if it's not zero, then people are having a problem dealing with that account, right? This used to be called undeposited funds. So then we've got the total current assets, and then we've got the fixed assets. Fixed assets, property, plants, and equipment, buildings, uh, equipment, cars, automobiles, and whatnot, and uh, furniture 
are typically going to go into here. Notice if I go into this account, we're not going to have a whole lot of detailed transactions within it, even less than like an accounts receivable, far less than a cash account because we don't buy furniture all the time. We bought beautiful furniture when we started up the shop. We expect that furniture to last for some time unless we have some rowdy, you know, mean mean people that are that are going to you know, they mess up the furniture just for the fun of it. They put they like put magic marker on it because they think it's cool or put gum in my under the seat cushion or something like that. But we don't deal with those kind of clients. We steer clear from that kind of hoodlumages is hoodlumages and so then so that means our furniture is gonna last for a long time. We shouldn't see a lot of detail in here because because of that. And we only record to this when you have large purchases, then the question is, should I put it on the books as an asset or can I just expense it? Also note that this is an accrual account. So is the inventory, by the way, this is an accrual account. And uh, you can't really get away from this accrual account, even if you want to, if you're in the United States, for example, because the tax code is gonna force you to do some type of, of accrual component to fixed assets and intuitively people know that because if you buy a building people don't building expense doesn't readily come to mind even if you paid cash for it right you're going to put it on the books as an asset because you because you intuitively know that it doesn't make any sense to just write off the entire building that you use for business because it's an investment you're going to use it over a long period of time and therefore it makes more sense to write off the cost of it over the period of time that you're going to use it because then the income statement will be able to match you'll be able to to compare one period to the other so even if we even if when we don't understand the accrual method at all we still kind of use it sometimes but uh but it's nice to kind of have it a little bit more concrete so you're going to have to do it there then we're going to depreciate it which is just going to going to allocate the cost we're only going to have a transaction in the accumulated depreciation possibly monthly or yearly and we might get that information from our tax preparer and the tax software, which we will talk about more in uh, a future presentation or section or course on uh, the adjusting entries. We've got the prepaid insurance. So this is gonna be, an, I possibly should have put this in the current assets. I put it into other assets here. I, sh I should put it, let me change that right now. That's not right. Let's go to prepaid assets here and go do, 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 do uh prepaid i put it into uh other assets i want to put it into current assets let's go ahead and see if i can edit that one i did this on purpose by the way just to show you that you can change it if a mistake has been made then we just correct the mistake we don't get upset or anything it's going to be okay other current asset i'll just put it there i'm sure someone will comment on that before uh uh, before but then i'm going to put it into then i'm just going to say other current asset let's do that and then if i go back to the balance sheet and run it again we're going to say there's the prepaid insurance in uh, the twelve thousand. so that represents similar concept as the uh, furniture and fixture actually in that we paid for the insurance before we used it so therefore we put it on the books as an asset. Now it's not as extreme an example and you, you might not have to deal with it as much with the tax code in the United States if you basically expense it when you purchase it, for example. So you wanna, you wanna think about whether or not you need to do that or not. Uh, there's different methods you can use to deal with the prepaid insurance. You might just expense it when you purchase it and then tell your accountant about it at the end of the year so that they can do an adjusting entry. But the normal way to deal with it is you put it on the books as an asset and then you expense it as you consume the insurance, meaning as the policy expires. And, and so that's how we have it here. So then we have the total assets. So the 227, 695, 77, notice it says dollars, but remember it's not all dollars. Most of it will not be dollars. So it's not like I can just pay someone. It's not like if I wanted to, to, to close up shop, I'm just gonna have $227. No, I'd have to go through the pain of liquidating all of the equipment and whatnot to try to see if I can get that much money <laughs> from it. So we don't want to have to open and close the businesses kind of willy nilly or at will kind of thing. It's not something that you could just turn on and turn off 
uh, were taking on a risk by buying the assets, right? The furniture and equipment and whatnot. All right, liabilities side of things. We've got the current liabilities. That's a normal, uh, a normal financial statement account. But then we have the same thing we had with the accounts receivable with the accounts payable has a separate account. Why? Because we need to be tracking this by by vendor. This is another account that will only be there if you have an accrual system for it if you're entering bills, which is less likely oftentimes for a small business because small businesses might just pay the bills as they become due, either with a credit card or with the, the checking account. So larger businesses are more likely to really get into tracking the accounts payable due to the number of transactions, the size of transactions, which makes it a lot more advantageous. There's a benefit to trying to delay payment as much as possible. You don't have as much benefit of that if you have smaller transactions in dollar amounts that are also rarer or they don't happen as often. Paying the phone bill $70 today versus 15 days from now doesn't save you much money. But if you were had thousands of transactions that are happening for thousands of dollars, then paying today versus 15 days from now can be impactful due to the time value of money. So in any case, this has a sub ledger account as well. So if I go to the tab to the right and I open up my reports, then all of the, the reports under this one, what, what you owe are basically tied to that accounts payable account, similar to what we saw with the accounts receivable. So for example, if I go into this accounts payable, do, 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 I wanna just go into the vendor balance summary. Let's go into the vendor balance detail. So there we have it, nothing's in it right now. Let's see if I go to the dates, custom date, as of 013124 and run it. So nothing's in there. Do I not have anything? Yeah, nothing's in it. Nothing's in it right now. So that makes it easy. All right. But if we drill down on it, if I click on it, what's the activity in here? You're going to see it increasing with a bill. Let's go back one more day to or year. It increases with a bill and then it decreases when we pay the bill. That's all you expect to see in here. So just those transactions, it goes up and then it goes back down. Obviously, we also manage this information in the customer and the vendor center internally as well. Then we've got the visa. We haven't done much for the visa, but if you were to pay off your expenses as they become due with the visa account, your credit card account, it will function must, much like the checking account. A lot of times it's harder for people to envision that, but it's the same thing like you can use bank feeds on it which we will do in a future course or section and you can track that information increasing and decreasing it's just that instead of the checking account going down when you buy stuff and expense it the other, you can have a liability going up and then you'll pay off that liability so that's a so it's easy to kind of track but again you'd like to be using the checking account obviously from a practical standpoint or you would at least like to be paying off the credit card so you're not getting hit with those interest charges. And then we've got the other current liabilities, everything that doesn't have a special category. The reason the visa has a special category is the same for why the bank accounts do, because you could connect them to bank feeds. Everything that's not connected to the bank feeds and whatnot is in other current liabilities. These are gonna be the, this I believe are the accounts for the sales tax. So sales tax, if you owe sales tax and deal with sales tax, that's gonna be something different from location to location. If you're outside the United States, then you have to deal with whatever tax system that you are in as well. It might be like a usage tax where you would have a similar kind of situation. Remembering the full accounting process is the same. Double entry accounting system, same, doesn't change. Taxes, laws change with bookkeeping. Tax law is the biggest implication that will change from place to place. In the United States, we have federal tax is an income tax, not sales tax. The sales tax are then charged by the state and local areas, and they will be going up when we have invoices and sales receipts, the sales forms, and they'll go down when we pay the sales tax, which we have not yet done. So I'm gonna go back on out, and then we have the payroll. So we have the payroll liabilities, these would only be here well they're only going to be generated automatically if you're processing payroll within the quickbooks system 
and then they will be generated when you process the payroll because of the withholdings and then we will pay them off and they will go back down. If you're doing payroll outside, you have an ADP or a paychex, for example, then you might still enter the liabilities on a monthly basis or a pay period by pay period basis based on the reports that you get from the from your payroll provider. And then you can enter it more easily, right? You, you don't have to enter all the detail. You just have to enter the liability. Or you might just stay on a cash-based system and just record it as an expense whenever it comes through the system, whenever you actually pay the cash, and then tell your accountant or tax preparer at the end of the year to take the payroll reports, and they would then periodically do the, the adjustments to things like the payroll liability account and possibly breaking out the payroll tax. So that system could, could work. And that gives you our liabilities, and then we have the equity side of things, where we have the opening balance equity. It's never been used except when we set up the account and then we cleared it out because it looks ugly because it's, it's an unprofessional account because it's, a, it's an account that just got money dumped into it, which doesn't look good. So then we have the an owner investment account, the 65,000. That's us as the owner putting money into the company. If it was a corporation, it would be called uh, a capital account or, or the, the, the stock, the common stock that was issued. We don't expect much activity in here, of course, because we don't want to be putting money into the business all the time. That happens rarely, hopefully, when we start the business and when we grow the business and want to like expand it. Otherwise, we, we would expect money to be coming out of the business in the form of draws. This account classically usually then would also be rolling into the equity account of retained earnings or opening equities on a yearly basis, if not monthly basis. But QuickBooks does not do that automatically. So if you want to do that, you'd have to close it out with a journal entry at the end of the year. If you don't do that, it's okay, but this account will just be representing your investments over the life of the business as opposed to the last year of the business. The owner's equity is the account that's similar to the retained earnings. You can, it's for a, for a sole proprietorship. It is the retained earnings for the sole proprietorship. And you can see that, that I can't click on this account because this account has a special use it's the account that basically the net income is going to roll into the net income down here so it represents the net income not of the last year but of the life of the business that has been accumulated which has not yet been given to the owner in the form of if a sole proprietorship draws if a corporation dividends also the investments could roll into it uh as well so so if you're a sole proprietor net income this is not an actual account the net income is an, is something that's trying to show how the income statement is related to the balance sheet so the income statement is over here here's our net income 742744 same amount over here if i go up one year to 010125 to 123125 that net income rolls in to the equity account. So it does it automatically. Notice it did not roll in the investment automatically. So if you wanted to roll that in, you would need to do a journal entry on a yearly basis, perhaps. Let's go ahead, but if you don't, it'd probably be okay. 010124 to 123124. And so let's go back over and then let's go to the income statement, the other major report, otherwise known as the profit and loss. So in the income statement, notice the sales lines. All the sales that we made, we sold a whole bunch of different kinds of guitars and we had different types of services, but we did not record income into all these different kinds of accounts. We didn't record the income into every different kind of guitar we sold or income into every different service item we had. We might have some categories that we wanna put on the income statement, but you don't want to have too many categories. One reason being because you will typically have subledgers to help you out with that. Similarly, you don't typically want to have a different income account for every customer. Notice we, we dealt with many different customers. I don't see which customer we dealt with on the income statement, but I can look at that information typically on subledgers. Let's take a look at that. If I go to the tab to the right, open up the ham boogie go to the reports close up the ham boogie 
And if we go down to these sales and customers, these reports, most of these have to do with more information about the income line items, which are revenue, income, uh, sales are terms often used. So you can break out the income lines by uh, sales, by customer, and you can break it out by product and service. That'll give you more detail. Now note that those, those subledgers will only give you, let's, let's take a look at one of them, income, income by, uh, by sales, let's say income by customer summary. Let's do this one income by customer detail and then sales by product summary. Let's do that one. So if we look at those as of, let's go from 010124 to uh, 01.3124. Oh man, 01.3124, run it. And we got 53,987. And this is my income by who we sold it to. If I go back on over to my income statement way over here uh, and I look at my income to, to 53,857. Is that what I had over here? 53,987. What's the difference? Let's take a look at it. 53,987 minus do, 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 the minus the 53,857 is $130 difference. Where did that come from? That's because we had that funny thing down here with the negative supplies that's throwing us off. So notice that this report doesn't have to, to tie out the subledger because it's possible to record something to, to income that doesn't have a customer related to it. QuickBooks doesn't force you to do it as they do with the balance sheet where they force you to have a customer every time you hit something to accounts receivable or accounts payable. So that means your subledger might not always perfectly tie out, but if you use the sales forms, invoices, and the sales receipts, when you record something to your income accounts, it should uh, tie out. If you're not using those forms, you're using a balance sheet, possibly because you have gig work, something's coming in from YouTube or something, then you're not gonna have these subledger reports because the, the that deposit form isn't the form that QuickBooks wants to use generally for the sales items. You might still do that. That would be easy to do in certain businesses. And in that case, you might have an income account broken out in essence by customer or by platform, YouTube income, right? Versus whatever platform income might be appropriate in that case. This one is broken out by what we sold. So the guitars and the other items that we sold, 44,287. Uh, if I go back on over here, we're at the, 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 the <laughs> we're at here, the 53. So now we've got 53,857 minus, this is coming out to uh, minus the 44,287 is a difference of 9,570. Okay, that's too much of a difference. There's the dates off. Hold on. 01, I told you it was always a date thing. 01, 31, 24, let's run it. And so now we've got uh, 53, 987. All right, back to the profit and loss, 53, 857. So I won't go into detail on that one. We're running long on time, but similar, similar thing. We break it out by item. Now the cost of goods sold, now notice the revenue accounts. If I go into the revenue accounts, they only go up, right? All of the income statements accounts should only go one way. You don't see the decreases because it's like driving a car to see how long you're going to go in a certain time frame. You're only going one way up, right? The odometer is going one way up. So typically that's what all of your income statement accounts will be doing. Income goes out with invoices and sales receipts. If we look at the expense side of things, they always go up typically as well. But when we look at the net income, these two things that go up are gonna be subtracted, right? So if I go to the cost of goods sold, those are gonna be recorded, even though they're an expense with the sales forms, if you're using a perpetual inventory system, invoices and sales receipts, because when those things happen, you are recording revenue related to them, but you're also recording the expense of the thing that you sold to help you generate the revenue. And that gives us a subcategory down uh, of gross profit 
income minus the cost of goods sold. And then we have all of the other expenses. So we had payroll expenses, which we saw were processed when we, uh, when we process the payroll and the wages. So those will be impacted every time we process the payroll, taxes and wages. And then we have all the other categories of expenses, which will typically be the easiest thing to do the data input because oftentimes you can use bank feed for those expenses that happen on a cyclical process. And we'll talk more about bank feeds in future presentations, but the forms you would expect to see then is an expense form. Now we used a check form in some of these and we messed up with this one with an invoice just to show a weird thing happening, but you would expect to see if you use the bank feeds, only expense forms basically in here, and like utilities, you, you, will, you would only see like expense forms normally, or if you use checks, you would only use check forms, those two forms being similar, except the check form has check numbers within it. All right, so that's the general idea. I'm gonna go to the tab to the right now and let's close this one up let's close this one up and i also want to go all the way down to the accounting reports and let's open up our do, 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 that's payroll accounting for my accountant i want to open up the the journal report right click and open the journal report and then i'm going to go over here and take a look at the transaction de, transaction list by date report I'm going to right click and open that report. So a quick reminder on the on the trial balance. So the trial balance is the balance sheet on top of the income statement. We've talked about it at the end of every presentation, so I won't go into it in detail here, but you can get the general idea. Assets up top are typically basically debits, except that funny contra asset representing what the company has without all the subtotals and whatnot represented or measured in dollars. And then the liabilities and equity represent who has claim to those assets and we can see these are the liabilities down to here down to here and then here's where our equity starts the whole income statement you can think of as more detail about one year's worth of equity because the balance sheet is reported as a point in time the income statement is a time frame therefore if i was to close this out all this bottom bit will just close out to here all these if i just add up the the credits minus the debits, it'll end up with a credit balance if the if the company is a going concern, meaning it's it's uh, not underwater. So let's go from let's bring this up from 010125 to 123125, and you can see then it stops at equity and everything rolled into this 85323. So all of the income statement is detail about what happened over a point in time that is you can think of as a part of equity it's breaking out a, a year of history that got us to the point where we are equity equity being represented by the accounting equation shown as assets minus liabilities is equity right so let's go back to 010124 to 013124 run that then if your numbers tie out if you're following along with this if your numbers tie out here great you should be good to go up to the next month where we'll do the next month of data input. If not, then we can look at these reports over here to give us more detail about them. Now, the major report I think is best for this is this one, actually. This is the transaction detail by date. So let's change the date. I'm gonna say custom date from 010124 to 013124. And so, if your balances were correct as of the beginning of the of our system, meaning the end of the last section, so then we should, so in other words, we left off last time on the trial balance as of 12.31.23, 12.31.23. This is what we entered last time. This is where our trial balance was after we entered just the beginning balances that we imagined came from the prior accounting system. This is our starting point. This is all the detail that happened. If your detail matches exactly on this side, then your ending balance must work. Meaning if I then go to the ending balance of uh, 010123 to uh, 013123, then our uh, 010124, 
then your ending balance must tie out. So if you can't figure out what went wrong, then you can go over here and try to see if each of these numbers tie out, which is kind of a tedious task, but that could give you an idea of what is going on. So if something is on our side, but it's not on your side, then you might wanna change the date range and increase the date and see if there's an added item that's in there from a date issue. And if it is, drill down, adjust the date issue. If not, that might be something that you need to add. If there's something on your side that isn't on our side, then the question is, you know, why? Is it, did you enter it twice? Did something get entered twice or something like that? Possibly you would need to delete uh, that transaction. And if everything ties out exactly, then we should have basically the same numbers. Now note what this report does is it's gonna give you the transaction type, that's the forms. It's sorted by date over here, which would be nice if I could see it. So there's the date and then uh, the posting, maybe I can make this one smaller. And then the location, I don't think I really need that. Description, and this is the split account. There's always two accounts that are impacted. So if it's a deposit form, the primary account they think of as the checking account, right? And then where did the other side go? This one went to the owner's investment. So we have the in inventory deposit. Let's look at an expense. Expense account, the primary account is the checking account. Where did the other side go? Well, in this case, it went to the investments. Expense account, checking account, furniture and equipment. Purchase order. Uh, this, is, this, this actually doesn't have an impact on your financial statements. So it's not actually recording a uh, transaction. What account are they saying here? Oh, what did I do? That's not what I wanted to do. Let's go back. Okay, let's just look at a couple other of these. Uh, and then we have the, the checking, the check. So that's gonna come out of the checking account as your primary account. The other side, it has a dash. That means that it's a split account. It might be affecting more than one account. And that's where this report kind of falls short. You'd have to drill down on the transaction to find the, de the detail. Then we've got the billable expense, to do, 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 payment, a payment. The primary uh, account is going to be the clearing account. Oh, man. It's kind of sticky. It gets sticky here. Okay, it payments to deposit. The other account, the other side over here. Okay, that's the general idea. Now, this other report, I just want to look at it for detail. This is the journal report. This is a great report for learning the debits and credits. Now, if you found some transactions over here that have that dash, you can look at them over here and you, you can look at the full accounts that are, effect, are affected in debit and credit format. You can also get an idea of what each of the forms are doing uh, in terms of debits and credits. So I'll just scroll through this one here. So you can see this is an inventory starting. This is a deposit form and you can see it's increasing the checking account. And here's the other account that's affected the loan the loan payable account here's an expense form checking accounts going down with a credit investment here's an expense form checking accounts going down and then the furniture and equipment an asset account same thing here with an expense form here's a check form decrease in the checking account the other side's going into our inventory uh, assets that were purchased and then we have this one where checking account is going down inventory assets these are invoices which are somewhat complex see with the invoice. So we've, we've got the debit increase in the accounts receivable, crediting the sale of product income, inventory asset is going down, balance sheet account, cost of goods sold, expense account going up, inventory uh, asset going down, cost of goods sold going up. And it's a long one. Why? Because there's multiple items that we purchased. So it's recording each of the different inventory items, I believe, instead of grouping them all in together into one you know, like inventory account doesn't need to be repeated if you were to condense the journal entry, but because we had multiple line items. And then the payment form, payment to deposit, debit, accounts receivable going down with a credit. And then your invoices again, payment forms, sales receipt, similar to an invoice, except that it's gonna go into a cash type of account, payment to deposit, that's where the debit is. And then you've got the sales receipts, deposits, da, 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 da. So those are just some, some, some to look at. Uh, next section, if your trial balance is, is, is all tied up, then you'll be good going forward. If, if not, well, you can try to start from that point going forward as well or follow along 
with the test drive or whatever you need to do. But if this is the starting point where you're at now, then we'll do a similar type of thing. And after we're done with that, we'll, we'll hopefully end up with the same ending balance and then we'll run these reports again to take a look at the detail of it.